Hi, hello, and welcome, everyone. My name is Bo Estes, and you're watching the third installment of the FBC Web Show. Each Thursday, we get together with a couple of folks inside the basketball industry. We chat hoops. We chat the hoops business. And this week, we got a couple of heavy hitters from over at ESPN. We start off with Kirk Goldsberry, who has made the well-worn trip from cartographer to basketball analyst. He's the author of Sprawl Ball. How are you doing, Kirk? I'm doing great, Bo. How are you doing? Hanging in there, hanging in there. Uh, you can see uh, the hair's getting a little longer, but that's <laughs> that part of it, man. Uh, we're, we're getting by. Um, next up, we've got uh, also from ESPN and uh, host of the Pack Your Knives podcast, Kevin Arnovitz. Kevin, how are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm, I'm doing good. We like your books there in the background. We understand you've read every one of them. Is that right? No, I think like 94%, maybe. 94%. That's a good number. That's a good number. Uh, before we get started, guys, we, we wanted to thank all of the, of the first responders, everybody who is keeping us safe during this time, the frontline workers, I, you know, the guy who delivered my pizza. I want to thank him because these people are out risking it for us, especially those doctors, those nurses. They're doing a terrific job. Also, the youth sports operators, that's an industry... People aren't talking about it as much, but the kids and the parents, they're feeling the effects of this. So we're hoping that we can get back to that way of life sooner rather than later. And finally, as a reminder, the Sports Business Classroom is an immersive training and educational experience. Go to sportsbusinessclassroom.com to apply today. You can also catch any of our podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, or Seeker. And now it's time to uh, talk to our experts, fellas. Uh, We've been in quarantine for a little bit. Let, let's start off with you, Kevin. What what have you been up to? How have you been filling your time? I mean, it, it's pretty regimented. I am still working. There, there, there are NBA stories to be had. Uh, but apart from that, I'm doing a lot of cooking, a lot of reading. I have a movie club with my partner, which is kind of, we, we one of us sends the other three titles for the evening's viewing, and the other one picks the final one. And then we reverse it the next night. So like watching stuff I haven't seen, like that I've wanted to watch for 10 years. So, and it's, that's kind of it. I mean, it's, it's a pretty simple, slower paced life. Um, and it, it's kind of working. How's that, how's that movie thing work out? I mean, do you guys oh, like it so far? Oh yeah. I mean, it's great. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Taste, yeah. Uh, Kirk, how you been feeling your, you look very relaxed, Kirk. Everything uh, good? Yeah, I'm pretty relaxed, but you know, I'm stressed out too. Um, but a lot of repetitive days here in Austin, Texas for me. Uh, like Kevin, I'm still working. I think the the Michael Jordan documentary has been very good for our company uh, and has provided us a lot of assignments to work on during this time. So I'm very thankful uh, for that. Uh, and then outside of work, similar to Kevin, a lot of reading, um, some television watching, and I bought a PlayStation 4, which is, which is big. I haven't had a video game console in my life in decades. Um, so one thing that coronavirus has meant in my household is uh, dad's playing video games again. So, Well, I have a nephew that has the PS, what, what's the latest, four? It's PS4, and he's trying to get me to buy the thing. But the last thing I have in my house is a Nintendo. So <laughs> I, I think I'd be uh, in over my head on, on that sort of thing. My, uh, my, folks, my folks wouldn't let me have it. So I had to play video games on the Apple IIc. Do you remember Lemonade Stand? <laughs> no. Wait, your parents okay. wouldn't ever let you have a video no, game? No, no. And, and the funny thing is, they weren't strict. It was just like, we don't need this. Oh, okay. Um, it wasn't like they were, we were, you know, sort of Luddites or anything. It was just like, it just never happened. Did you ever get into video games like college or anything? No, like that? and because it was this, this contraband, I would go to my friend's house and play Pitfall for hours <laughs> on Atari. <laughs> well, I know you guys are, are both pop culture, food, lifestyle guys. Kevin, we, we mentioned your podcast earlier, Pack Your Knives. T tell us, what else, have you learned any new skills? Have you, have you developed anything since, since we've had this sort of break from our normal uh, life? Yeah, like I'm, I've got some new recipes. Like, you know, the, there's, you know, cookbooks are great. And but there's always during the busyness of life, you look at a recipe and it's like, that's too complicated. Like, I don't have time for that. And so I'm starting to do the I don't have time for that ones. You know, you, you shop normally, you go out and you shop or do you get no, so I, it, it's interesting. It's a combination. Like I've got a chicken provider from Seattle who ships. I've got like I order a lot of stuff online and then these restaurants, I think because, you know, they have so much supply, they give you these like grocery packs Like you can go on like you're ordering anything like it's Amazon, except you want a head of lettuce. Do that. Like 
some cauliflower, get some milk, and and then you drive, you pop the trunk. You don't have to get out. They dump it in the trunk in bags, and you go home. So that's kind of uh, the way the way it's been going. A weird side of this is how quickly everybody's adapted to this new way of doing things. I, I think people have done, in, in a weird way, pretty well with that. Kirk, the only thing I've really developed is I, I had some old resistance since bands around my house. I've got those out. I use those basically now. Any new skills, any new thing you're doing? Uh, lots of yoga at my house, which is new. I, I don't want to say that I've been doing yoga for years, um, but I'm doing yoga every day, uh, which is good. Uh, the gyms are closed here, of course. Um, so instead of doing weightlifting, I'm doing yoga, which is probably better anyway. You know what I yes. mean? It's, it's probably, it's probably, a, it's, it might stick. It seems like a better, more peaceful, healthier, long-term choice anyway. So, you know, silver linings. Any results so far? Uh, you know, it, it has loosened up my back a little bit. And you said I was relaxed earlier in the, <laughs> in the show. So maybe, you know. It's good. That's fantastic. <laughs> well, let's, let's dive into some NBA stuff here. Kirk, let's start with you. Uh, I've, everybody's trying to figure out what the impact is going to be with this pandemic, uh, immediate and long term on NBA franchises. Any thoughts on your on your end? Well, I know from friends who are working for teams, it's a very stressful time. I mean, whether you're trying to oversee the draft process for a front office or where you're trying to to oversee a sports science and performance branch of a front office, you just don't know when stuff is going to happen. Um, and the NBA had relied upon and taken for granted a very structured calendar for years. Um, and when that's been thrown out, uh, you're seeing a lot of people scrambling. When's the draft going to be? End of August? Maybe. Who knows? Is there going to be a combine? I don't know. How are we going to get our draft models to work without all the data sets that we were expecting from the NCAA tournament uh, or EuroLeague and stuff like this? So, you know, whether you're talking about sports science uh, and then the cap guys are trying to figure out how much money there's going to be, um, who's going to pick up options. All of these things are just challenging um, in ways that they never have been. Um, so, you know, the landscape is just completely wonky and people don't know what to do and people still don't know what to expect. So everybody is just sort of making it up as they go along in different ways and in different parts of the organizations. I think you hit on something there. The landscape is kind of wonky. Uh, Kevin, Kirk brought a lot of issues up. Anything you're hearing from the people you talk to? How are, how are teams adapting? And, and what's the outlook in the immediate and long term? I mean, I, I still think there, 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 there's guarded pessimism. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is I think it's, it's abundantly clear revenue is going to be way down. I think the question becomes... It can. What happens if we don't have fans in the stands for months? And I'm not talking about the conclusion of this season with the playoffs. I'm talking about October, November, December, because then you're entering a world where player salaries, I mean, contracted amounts. And there's always been an escrow. And I'm, I'm sure you guys have talked about this all the time. So your salary is not exactly your salary on a, on a shortfall year. Maybe it's a little less. But and we're already seeing this in baseball, how contentious it is. Now, they don't have a salary cap. So it's more contentious. But typically in a business, when revenue is down and you're fighting over fewer dollars, that fight can get bad. And there's good relations right now between ownership and the, and the Players Association in the NBA. I think I have one of the best labor uh, relations among, in among professional sports. But one of the things we haven't seen is what is going to happen when now you've got to cobble together a provisional CBA. Now you've got to talk about, well, what do we do if revenue is down 20% because there's no gate in 17 cities? Or for that matter, people aren't comfortable congregating in a building with 16,000 strangers in a very, in, in essentially two city blocks. And so I think that is what we're going to watch. And what effect does it have on teams? I don't know. Uh, will front offices go back to something structurally in terms of personnel that looks more like 2012, you know, where these teams that have beefed up, it's been this arms war for eight, nine years. Now, you know, I've talked to a few executives and, and again, there's guarded pessimism. Well, one year shouldn't trigger that sort of reduction. Um, and, and finally, I think the interesting question I've been asking is, what does this do to the valuation of the franchises? So I have this question. I say, what if the median franchise goes up for sale on December 15th. And it's sort of, 
revenue's clearly down for this year, but we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, what does it go for less? And to a person, every single person says no. They're wow. only 30 that the market corrections that happen in other industries. I, I always use the Phoenix Suns just because I like it as a median franchise. Mid-market, some success, a, a decent market, a place some free agents will go. And I always say if that team went on the market for whatever reason. They say 1.7, 1.8 billion. I'm like, really? So that's what's interesting. I mean, I think the revenue shortfall is going to be, that could get rough. But the valuations apparently, hey, they're Picassos. They're only 30. Well, that's interesting because that's more guarded optimism on that side is, is sort of franchise valuation. We had uh, Eric Pincus on the show last week with us. And, and one of the, I guess, creative ideas that he talked about as a way to inject some money is expansion. Uh, to expand and, and add two new teams now so that you can get money in. Uh, can you imagine any other ways to improve revenue now creatively? It just, it just seems like, like a difficult challenge. Kurt, is there anything in your mind that, that could help right away? Well, I mean, the jersey patches are two, three years old now, and there's more room for more patches. If you look around the, the sports landscape on planet Earth, NBA uniforms are still relatively unencumbered by ads. Um, so if things got really bad financially and teams in the league were interested in, you know, another 20 million, $40 million check each year, the front of the Jersey is there to be taken. Now that violates all sorts of traditions in American sports. Um, but I don't know. I mean, watch, watching Korean baseball, like everybody else, one thing that struck me too, like everybody along, along the same <laughs> lines is the teams there aren't the San Antonio Spurs or the Dallas Mavericks. They're the LG Lions. The, 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 the actual city name is replaced by a brand. Um, there's a lot of things we could do. Uh, a lot of people would view those as compromised uh, relative to our standards in, in American pro sports. But man, uh, you know, desperate times, desperate measures. Uh, there are opportunities. Expansion is, is, is a fascinating one. I think 32 is a better number for a league in any sport anyway. Um, and I'm not quite sure if, if I think Mark Cuban's the one who said, you know, why are you going to divide my 30 piece by the 32 pieces or whatever? Um, so I don't know if, if the owners would go for that, but that's an interesting one too. I hadn't heard that one though. Kevin, your thoughts, any other creative ways to, to inject some money? I mean, it's a tough question, yeah. obviously, uh, but it's something I imagine teams are looking at now. And not only do they, is their schedule different? So they have to figure out a way to make some of that money back. I would imagine. I mean, I, I think now you're looking at what can we sell a midseason tournament for, you know, and they've been talking mm -hmm. about it for years and a play in tournament in the playoffs. Look, that's not chopped liver. I mean, that's six games that, you know, I hear numbers, 90 million, 100 million. Uh, when you talk about global distribution broadcast of that product. So you might have to get creative that way. And, and frankly, again, those are things that I think would, would be additives anyway. So maybe now is the time to figure that out. You know, can you reduce, you know, four games as they talked about uh, for, for the 75th anniversary season, but compensate for that lost revenue with, you know, essentially a 32 team tournament, uh, bring two international teams in, make, you know, give it a little novelty. So that to me is, I mean, yeah, the Jersey patches, though, I think advertising is going to be harder to get from corporations. I mean, ad dollars are already plummeting. Um, but to, to me, those long-term products that you've been talking about, figure out how to monetize them and let's get it done. So it looks like, you know, in Atlanta where I am, facilities are now opening and some teams are starting to let people in. What are you guys, Kevin, we'll start with you hearing about a, a potential timetable for a return to play if, if indeed that happens and, and what sort of format do you imagine a, a new schedule would take? Yeah, I mean... I Listen, I, I think anyone who says they know just doesn't know. And, and one of the, and just to, to divert for a second, one of the fascinating things about this story, and I'm, I'm sure this is Kirk's experience uh, too, which is even the biggest decision makers you talk to, people that you call because they speak with authority about everything, they're in the dark. I mean, nobody knows. I, I know there's optimism this week because the players are committed and the owners are committed. Big surprise, people who stand to recoup dollars by returning to play or, or for returning to play. There's still a lot of practical hurdles. I mean, my colleagues 
Brian Winhorst and, and Tim Bontemps wrote an interesting thing just about what the this bubble entails. And it's just, it's harder than you think logistically. Um, I'm of the belief that, look, I, if they are lucky enough to come back, that, oh, will there be an end of the regular season? I think only in so far as maybe there are a couple regular season games to get guys tuned up. They don't want their first game that matters or a real approximate of, of, of what an NBA game to be is game one of the playoffs. Um, so maybe you have a couple what would be exhibition games and just to get guys tuned up after their three week training camp, because you need that. And then I think they're going to try to get as many playoff games as possible. Playoff games are the mother's milk of the NBA when it comes to revenue. That is where the advertisers, the, the playoff contract is where or the playoff games are worth two thirds of the overall season contract. And I just think that that is going to be first and foremost, what they try to do. And I think if it means pushing the next season back, you do it. Kirk, your thoughts on that as, as we sort of slowly progress through some markers towards, towards resuming play, uh, what's it look like? What, it, what does a return to play look like and, and what kind of schedule could you imagine? I think the playoffs and maybe like Kevin said, and that's a maybe, uh, these these tune-up games. I, I talked to somebody from a non-playoff team yesterday, and they told me right away that the players on that team were not interested in playing. And this is confidential. This would never come out sure. um, on the record. Uh, but I, I thought it was interesting, and it got me thinking, yeah, if you're the 10th seed in the East right now or the 12th seed, like, why would you want to go back and play four games? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so – you know the the sixteen teams that should play for the for the championship uh, should play the playoffs. I think we all agree on that. That would be awesome. Um, the 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 trickiest part right now is the bottom of the Western Conference standings. Um, and Memphis, who's had the relatively easy schedule to date, uh, has that eight seed a few games over New Orleans, who's had a relatively hard schedule to date. So if you just said, "Hey, New Orleans, you're out. Memphis, you're in." Uh, the folks in New Orleans would have a reasonable beef to say, "Wait a second, uh, we got messed up here. We got we got screwed by this 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 the schedule that was weighted difficult uh, at the beginning of the year." And Memphis had the opposite, so no wonder we're a few games behind. Uh, so there are stuff like that 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 you have to iron out. Um, but I just don't see a team like Golden State um, really wanting to fire up the whole thing for a few meaningless games. Well, and then there's injury risk too, right? 100%. For stars, anybody like that. So I, I don't understand what their motivation would be. I, I mean, I understand that they would almost have to do it. But the other side, the other question I want to ask in this before we move on to the next topic real quick, what's a ramp up time like in your mind? Okay, we hear go and we're going to start on date X. How long do players need, and Kevin, I'll start with you, to get ready from go date to we're playing game one of a regular season game? I mean, when I talk to, to folks, at least three weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, we're at a point now where even if you said go now, we've almost had the duration of an actual off season. And so, I mean, we're essentially guy, telling guys it would be the equivalent of, you know, we're, we're just showing up to training camp. And the difference is a lot of these guys actually do a lot of serious endurance work in the off season, they haven't been able to do that. So it's not even just a regular off season when you're coming into camp to, you know, it's not like the old days where guys come into camp to literally get in shape, you know, but that's a minimum of three weeks before. And then I, I think this notion, the minimum of three weeks for what would be at least, Hey, then let's go into at least a transition period where we're not talking about playoff games. So it's going to be a while if it happens. Yeah, Kirk, your thoughts on that. I, I just, to me, I can't even imagine because the playoffs, the intensity level is different. Obviously, we've all been around the game long enough to know that the intensity level is different. It's from a start date, we get a date. How long till they can play game one of a regular season in your mind? What are you hearing? Yeah, three three to four weeks at minimum. Um, and with, with facilities opening back up slowly, uh, I think that makes July in play. Um, and one key point, point here, Bo, that I know we've all talked about in the recent weeks, but could this actually start the NBA down a path where we're regularly starting the schedule in December and playing through August as opposed to October to June? Um, and so this could be a beginning of that. So yeah, Kevin makes a great point. We've had this weird off season here, but if we finish at Labor Day or whatever, 
does that set us up uh, for Christmas 2020 being opening day of the 2020-2021 season? Um, and there's a lot of people in favor of that already. So I think it could actually start something that's better for the league in the long term, not fighting for NFL eyeballs uh, for two months and really not showing up on people's minds until after the Super Bowl in many cases. Okay. Yeah. I want to jump on that because that, that's an interesting topic. I know Steve Coonan, among others here with the Atlanta Hawks, has mentioned a December slash Christmas start. Kevin, any advantages in your mind to that start? And I, I heard Kirk mention the NFL. Yeah, uh, Coonan delivered that uh, proposal on my panel at Sloan. So let, let me uh, let me get out my, my let me get my soapbox out because <laughs> this is a big issue for me. Let me take you to the week after Thanksgiving in 2018. You might remember the game if you're an NBA junkie. Warriors at Raptors showcase Thursday night game for the NBA. Kevin Durant at Kawhi Leonard, still novelty, new Toronto Raptor. Durant goes for 51. It's an overtime game. Kawhi goes for 37. Let me give you a statistic. In the Bay Area, home of the world champion, Golden State Warriors dynasty, that game lost to Cowboys Saints, a Thursday night NFL game. In their own network, I'm sorry, in their own market, the Warriors lost to a game between the six and five Cowboys and the New Orleans Saints, teams that exist 1,500 miles away. When you talk, and, that, and I can give you example after example of how the NBA gets annihilated. You talk to these guys like Coonan and, and the Memphis guys, they will give you examples of coming in on a Monday morning and watching their local ratings getting beat by 21, a factor of 21 to an SEC game on a Saturday night. Um, the NBA should consider this long term. Why are they willfully getting their butts beat every single from from October to early December? I mean, I don't I don't want to push it that far. And here's the thing. And then I'll go just one more minute. I started talking to advertisers, the people who do the ad buys, because when you ask people around the league, should we do this? They all say the same thing. Tell me what the advertisers think. The advertising model is something out of 1978. This notion that the third quarter, you can't sell any ads. It's baloney. I talked to a top consumer packaged good company that sells, I mean, a, a, a Fortune 500 company that you would recognize. It's, it's always on sports. They said, you don't think we'd like to sell products in July? Um, I talked to Universal Pictures, the number three advertiser for the 2019 finals television broadcast deal. They said, you don't think we have summer vehicles that we roll out in July and August, these, these franchises that we wouldn't love? This idea that they couldn't sell ads, which has always been the impediment, is baloney. And the league should consider doing this. You talk about how to pick up revenue. That's one way. Well, so Kevin mentioned a lot of really positives to this. Kirk, are there any negatives to go into a Christmas start? And I assume we finish in August. Is, is that about right? Is that is that where we target a finals in August, I suppose? Yeah, and this might sound conceited or, or glib, but like, yeah, taking the summer vacation away from the entire community of the NBA and essentially making us work through everybody's summer vacation. And then you get this vacation in September and October, um, that, which is not aligned with the rest of the country, generally speaking. That's kind of weird. Um, that's a minor thing, but it's on the minds of a lot of people in the front office world with children. Uh, it's on the mind of a lot of players with children. Uh, so that's an interesting part of this. But another thing that one of my students at the University of Texas brought up, um, he was a grad assistant for the University of Texas basketball team. And he said college basketball could do this too. And in fact, if you move college basketball to start to December or January, um, that sport becomes a one semester sport and that's better for the student athletes. And so maybe the whole calendar of basketball should move from October-ish to December-ish, and yes, yeah, screw our, fa our family vacations get messed up. Who cares? You know, it's a small price to pay. Um, if business is going to be so much better, as Kevin points out with these ratings, um, if you're ag not against the NFL until uh, or at the very beginning, and, 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 and except for the very beginning, and college kids have a better experience playing college basketball because they only have to worry about one semester balancing classes in their sport. Um, you could get the drafts and the combine all there like in August and September and everybody's happy. So 
yeah, there are some shortcomings. Maybe there are some ones that I don't understand, but the ones I've heard of are relatively minor, though. Kirk, yeah. Kirk mentioned a couple of, of, of points against it, but nothing major, it seems like, Kevin. As you, as you analyze that, what are your thoughts? I'm going to cut Kirk some slack because I, I don't want to do Christmas Day. I want to start the Wednesday of Thanksgiving Eve. Oh, the, okay. the NFL owns, there's nothing on. It's actually always been a really good night for the NBA in yeah. terms of ratings, they, that Wednesday night game. Book in Wednesday, Friday. Wednesday, you know, you do your double header and Friday, it's mall or ball, right? Anybody wants to go shopping on Black Friday, they go to the mall. You're a basketball fan, you watch ball, and, and, and there's nothing on. I mean, I don't want to watch Texas, Texas A&M. With all due respect <laughs> to Kirk Goldsberry, <laughs> who wants that? I mean, isn't that the, that's always the game, right? Like, who cares? So I, I think we can actually do this. Uh, a little, we don't have to wait till Christmas. I, I think you do it. And, and don't forget, I think they peel the NFL peels back its schedule a little bit. And don't forget, college is pretty much over in December. They they're on hiatus right. essentially till the Blue Bonnet Bowl or whatever the hell is played there. Um, so uh, you know, I, I think I think you can split the difference here. I think that probably doesn't give you a whole vacation. Um, Kirk, but those of us without children, imagine the shoulder season in Italy. <laughs> imagine the deals you can get in yeah, September, dude. October. You know, hey. now I'm paying forty percent less than I'm not fighting off all the tourists in uh, on the Amalfi Coast. Come on, hey, uh, there's good deals right now, Kevin. Go get them. Yeah, there. Yeah, Kevin. Kevin cited a lot of first world problems there. Uh, <laughs> Kirk, your response to the art of its compromise there with a with a November start. I think it should all be on the table. And honestly, you know, it should come down to, you know, Kevin brought up the 1978 average. There's a lot of this historical precedent that just needs to be reevaluated and everything should be reevaluated. And one of my other students had a great quote in their final paper this week, which was never let a good crisis go to waste. Rob Emanuel. That's, yeah. That's, that's what the league needs to do here. And yeah, dude, maybe Thanksgiving is the right time, Bo. I don't know, um, but I could tell you that mid-October doesn't seem like the right time covering the league for years, being a part of a team. It just, it doesn't feel like it. I mean, nobody, the, the buzz isn't around. And then, yeah, after Christmas, heading into All-Star, NFL wanes, the NFL uh, goes away entirely, and we finally get our, our time. And then the national conversation really revolves around the NBA in the last 10 years uh, in ways that it hadn't previous to that. So, look, I think we need to recognize not only NFL is a monster, but MLB is in a different spot than it was when we started organizing these 82 games and our playoff schedule and getting out of there by June. Um, the whole thing is different. And my only point is we should reevaluate the fundamental schedule. And that would include something that's right in Kevin's wheelhouse, Bo. How many games should we play? Kevin, the, the floor is yours. Go ahead. That, he set you up perfectly. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things you can do with the midseason tournament, and because let's just start the premise. The reason you don't want to shorten the schedule is you lose revenue, right? And we can talk about scarcity, but I think there's a lot of evidence that you're going to lose revenue, and we need to account for that. And that's where I think the midseason tournament and a, a play in tournament can help. And actually, I heard a great proposal from a CEO of a mid market team. He likes the way you want fewer games, I think so that there's more meaning. So it would be great to go to a 64 season game, uh, game season, but oh, okay, now you're losing all that revenue. What if ahead, what if October, if you, if you can't move the schedule, let's say, why does not October become group play ahead of the tournament? You got a home and home with each division, you know, maybe you go to five divisions of six and you only play Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays to avoid the NFL. And it's sort of, these games count in the so far as they will determine seedings for the mid-season tournament, which isn't really mid-season. It's more of a holiday. It would probably go in, you know, from Thanksgiving to Christmas. And again, you can kind of work around the NFL. And then on January 1, you start the, whatever it is. I don't have the exact dates, but I think the idea is you don't want to lose too much revenue. You get 10 games that count, but don't count. And so you can preserve that scarcity in the 64. You also get the mid-season tournament and you get the play-in tournament. So again, revenue recovery, you get scarcity, you get new products, uh, you get some novelty. And I imagine this all gets pitched to the players as keeping revenue high, right, Kirk? Because the, the addition of all these games doesn't seem like it would be something that the players would just jump on and love right from the start, right? No, in fact, the opposite, I yeah. think it's fair to say. So, yeah, you're striking some 
crazy balance between keeping the RSN, the regional sports network happy, um, keeping the players association happy. And of course, keeping the owners happy and, and the gate uh, consistent. So all of this has to result in more revenue. And the first thing you can't really do is strip out 15 to 20 RSN broadcasts without replacing with something major. Um, and a midseason tournament would be awesome, but how do you replace all of those broadcasts? And I know Kevin's thought about this more than me, um, but it could work. It could work. It's just a question of being pretty creative. And again, now is the time. This is an opportunity to do something like that. Um, but I'm not sure what exactly it might look like. Yeah. I mean, it's so interesting. We could do this all day and I'm, I'm with Kurt. I, I think, look, we can look at the Fox deal with Sinclair. What's happened to the value of those RSNs even since that deal? I mean, I, I don't want to kick a, a dog while it's down, but I think, you know, what are the chances that in 15 years you're going to tune in to a regional sports network to watch your local game? I don't know the answer to that. And and I have friends in the RSN world who might send somebody after me for saying this. I, I just, but it goes back to what Kirk said. We do live in 1978 in many respects. And I just, I'm one of these people. And it's funny. I'm an optimist. And so I think we can do this stuff, but I'm also a pessimist in that I worry about pro sports. I worry about baseball and basketball in particular, because I, I just think there's too much competition for the eyeball. Like, like I call this the Irishman problem. You know, I grew up in a world and Kurt, you, the three of us grew up in a world where I don't know about you. I, I cleared the table. I did my chores. I flopped down on the couch and on a Tuesday night, and the answer was, what is the best sporting event on television? Because that's what I was going to watch. If it was Purdue, Ohio State, fine. I, I would prefer it to be the Hawks or the Braves, because I grew up in Atlanta, but or Tech. But you that's the world we all grew up in. You the, the, There was nine channels, or maybe it got to 24. Ooh, we got the USA Network. That was cool. You know, uh, WWOR, you got a Mets game. But, like, that was it. That was the world we lived in. Who... You have so much choice. If you are 17 years old, like what are the chances you're going to tune in to Fox Sports Carolina for a Charlotte Hornet game, one out of 82 against, let me ring it up for you, the Indiana Pacers on a Monday night. What are the ratings for something like that? When you have Netflix just dropped a new feature, Amazon just dropped a new series. You've got stuff saved on your DVR that you've been dying to do. Like, I just think that if, Basketball doesn't, the NBA doesn't solve this problem. Make games more meaningful. Make more games have more meaning. They're in trouble long term. And so I go to the I go to the owners and say, pay for it now or pay for it later. And by that you mean you've got to shorten the schedule? Is that what is that what you're thinking? I, I don't think shorten it is I, I kind of like this group play. Like give more game, more games have to have meaning. What percentage of regular season games right now have meaning? And when so I mean meaning, the European soccer model, right? You've got it. You've got a Champions League going on one side, and you've got your La Liga schedule at the same time, right? And you have fewer games, so sixty-four is cool because I mean, as Kirk can tell you, a little more randomness. Teams can hang out. You know, a five-game winning streak all of a sudden means you're you know in the hunt uh, because you've reduced the number of, of games that that qualify you for the playoffs. But then you also have this tournament, which matters for two or three weeks, where you'd ultimately be in the doldrums of the season. And then you have this group play, which is a novelty at the beginning of the season because hey. I don't want to face the, you know, if it's the Warriors or, or, or the Clippers or the Lakers, I don't want to face them in the first round. That's kind of preposterous. Those are sort of, that's almost your, your, if you were your, your conference tournament, so to speak. Um, and you give, so all of a sudden you've got meaning for the first six weeks of the season. Right when that ramps down, oh, Christmas Day comes. That's meaning. We love Christmas Day. It's a great day. And then you sort of start a season where, all right, it's a it's reduced number of games, but you but you don't lose the revenue because you've been getting revenue for the last eight weeks. Well, and if there was an, ever an opportunity, like we pointed out, now's the time for big change. We're in a crisis. We we, we can make changes now and and see how it shakes out. Um, I'm an NBA TV guy. I know you guys are both ESPN guys, and you've got this this wonderful last dance going on right now. Kirk, I I read an article you wrote recently about how Michael Jordan would do in today's NBA. So I want to get both your thoughts on this. Kirk, you, you first, since you wrote the article, tell, tell me how, how does number 23 fare if he's out there today? Uh, well, you could be I'm, okay? 
I'm a child of the '90s, so I'm biased. But he would kick ass. Uh, long story short, uh, I'm not worried about him. He's literally the greatest athlete, aside from maybe LeBron, that I've ever seen on the on the floor. More than that, his body type is actually better for today's game uh, than it was for his era. Uh, he's a six six wing that is fast, quick, balanced, can jump out of the gym. Um, and I'm assuming if we're talking about Michael Jordan playing in 2020, that he was born in 1990 or 1995, sure. and he's going to be just fine from three point range because he grew up on courts with three point lines on them, unlike the real Michael Jordan. Um, but yeah, dude, uh, I'm not worried about Michael Jordan. In my opinion, he's the greatest competitor the league has ever seen. Uh, and he would have gotten himself to the top of the league, no matter what era he played in. Kevin, um, are you comfortable with Michael Jordan's chances in a modern NBA? Yeah, I mean, Kirk, in my opinion, has been the voice of record on this this notion, and I agree 100%. And, and to his point, like, when someone comes to me with, oh, but he, he didn't hit from – I was like, does anyone – is anyone under the impression that if you told a 21-year-old Michael Jordan, hey, look, three-pointing is going to be an essential part of success in the NBA <laughs> – that that dude wouldn't be shooting like 400 a day. And like, I mean, he would have been a 44, I mean, he would have been a 42% three point shooter. Um, and, and I, Lord knows what we've averaged Kurt. I mean, Kurt in a 100 possession league with three pointers with the frequency. I mean, what do you have as his PPG? I would get to 35 pretty easily. I think one way we looked at it is we, we bump up his efficiency because there's no hand checking and, and you, you assume that he can shoot from three. And so you, and he's not getting the crap out of getting the crap knocked out of him. He's got one. Crazy, he's right? Right? Right. Management. So if he had any sensible coach, he would be playing like Giannis style minutes, you know, uh, or Tim Duncan style minutes, 30, 34 minutes a game, right, so not the count. 42 he was playing, but regardless, dude, he's a monster. Like Kevin pointed out, like he, a 21-year-old Michael Jordan sees Steph Curry out there shooting threes, getting all this attention. Like the dude is gonna, he's gonna, he's he's just. If we've learned anything from the doc, Bo, it's that the dude was on a different level in between the ears. And he. But that's was, the thing, right? That's yeah. the work ethic. Okay, I see a deficiency in my game. That the modern game. I've seen players in the NBA as that have bridged this three-point era that have needed to improve three-point shooting. And I think there have there's examples of players who have been able to do it when it's a priority, when you need to do it. I think they are able to do it. Uh, one of the things I think about, you know, when I think about Michael Jordan, uh, Doc Rivers, and it may have been in your article, Kirk, I've read so many of these Michael Jordan articles now, called him the best superstar defender the league has ever seen. I, I imagine Kevin, Kurt, his defense transitions as well. I mean, I again, my theory on Jordan is if you tell him here are the terms of the game he's like okay thank you now I will go beat you just tell me the terms and I will succeed defensively or offensively yeah I agree Kirk he's gonna be okay defensively if if you ask the scout in 2020 to draw a picture of the ideal defensive specimen uh Michael Jordan wouldn't be far from that picture he six six as fast as they come as quick as they come as smart as they come um with length, come on, he's he's perfect. He's he's Clay Thompson, but with Russell Westbrook speed. He's 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 wow. he's he's the dream defender. Well, Kirk, I know you're in Texas now. We wanted to hit on something a little bit off basketball. What's the future of South by Southwest now with, with all this going on? Uh, what, what are you seeing there? Now, one theme that's come out here today, guys, is we don't know much, and uh, the organizers of South by Southwest got crushed this year and uh it's part of the the heartbeat of our town so we're hoping um you know i was going to interview masai jury at, at south by this year and i was really looking forward to that um and we lost that opportunity and, and countless other people like myself lost those things that said it was the right decision to do it um that said that company south by southwest has a challenge uh not unlike the nba's challenge how do we have south by southwest in 2021 uh and how do we keep it safe uh, because the events like South by or Mardi Gras or NBA All-Star, for that matter, seem to be among the most dangerous things for this particular virus. A bunch of people getting on airplanes, coming into crowded cocktail party environments. That doesn't seem like a safe thing to do anytime soon. So, hey, we're going to learn a lot in the next four months, five months. God willing, we'll have some vaccine options potentially. Uh, but we don't know. 
But man, I just I just hope that the things that make Austin, Texas special, uh, the food scene, the music scene, South by Southwest, we got to find a path forward to keep the soul of the city alive. And I think we will. Uh, Kevin, last thing for you, and I, I think this is some of our Hall Pass staff really wants wants a pro tip at this point. Favorite LA restaurant for takeout right now? You're on the line. What, what are you seeing, Kevin? All right, number so one, Bavel and and Bestia, same chef, same concept. They do these family dinners. It's ridiculously affordable for a very high end restaurant. You take it home. It's like six courses, but you eat it in the comfort of your own home. Um, you pop the trunk it's put in there. Manuel is another one I love and good old Chinese food, Newport seafood. The great news is you can get out to San Gabriel Valley from <laughs> central Los Angeles in like 19 minutes. So now is the time no to go traffic. explore all those places that are too far. All right, fellas. Th thank you so much. It it's been a real pleasure talking with you. And I know uh, our SBC students who are watching this, everybody else really got a lot out of it. So thanks so much. Thank you, Bo. Thanks. All right, and, and that'll do it for the third edition of our SBC web show. I'm Bo Estes. Go to sportsbusinessclassroom.com for more information on our program. And finally, thank you so much for watching, and thanks once more to our guests.